microbial growth is a competitor for oxygen. And so if you have too many microorganisms growing, then you're going to have discoloration due to microbial spoilage. The color that they really need to worry about is the natural color that has nothing to do with microbial growth. Hello, me folks. Welcome back to the Newspaper Podcast. Uh, today, we are at K State, back to my second home. And I've been uh, asking one of my, I consider my mentors on Ami Color, one of my uh, last phase of my of my doctorate. It was on meat color because I found to be a very important factor. In, for the meat industry, but also, also for consumers and some of the misconceptions that they may have. Welcome, Dr. Melvin Hunt, and for your friends, Hunter. Yes. yes. Thank you for being on the podcast. Yes. Well, th it's great to be here, and there's nothing more than I'd rather do than talk about meat color. And I, as a matter of fact, I just ask you, like when, when we were discussing, do you know something about meat color so we can discuss? Well, I think we need to know why is meat red? Why is meat turned brown? And why does the meat industry at almost every level have so many problems with meat color? That's what we'll talk about today. Because at the end of the day, you have control over a lot of the factors that, that can impact color. Yeah. It translates into money, right? The economics. So that's, that's why it's very important to know meat color. It is. As long as it is an issue and as long as consumers look for a certain color of product that this they need to know a little of the science behind meat color and that involves a, a, a basically a simple triangle which we call a, a meat a meat color triangle and if you start at the very beginning and you slice into meat that has never been exposed to air it's kind of a purplish red color and if you don't watch very soon, it starts to change to, uh, to bright red color. The purple red color, we say, is deoxymyoglobin, meaning that there's no oxygen in, in that muscle. Then it starts to bloom, turn bright red. It oxygenates, and that's really the color that most people pr uh, prefer, depending on the type of package that the meat is in. Now, the other question then is, well, because in every plant that, that harvests meat and fabricates meat, they slice it open for the first time, they see the deoxymyoglobin, the purple-red color, and then it turns bright red, and then how does it go back to the purple-red color? And that is the next series of interactions, the color chemistry, that are extremely important. Because the, the purple-red color deoxy has no oxygen bound to the myoglobin molecule. Myoglobin is the red-colored substance in meat. And when it blooms, it turns bright red, just like Mother Nature made it to do. And then it gives up that oxygen to the components that generate energy inside of a muscle cell. Once... The oxygen blooms, and there's about, and at sea level, there's about 20, 21% oxygen in the air. When that is reduced down to about 1 to 3%, it turns brown all by itself. Most people probably in the meat industry have seen that. If, they, if they've made some hamburger patties, you make the patties, stack one on top of the other, another on the other, put it, put it back in the refrigerator, and then when it comes time to put it on the grill, they come back and they take them apart. And, Whoa, that's brown. How did it get to be brown? Well, Mother Nature equipped that muscle chemistry to metabolize some of the oxygen, and when it gets down to a low percent, it turns brown all by itself. That's the easy part. That's a, that, that's, that happens no matter what we do. The question then becomes, because that brown pigment is called met 
myoglobin. The difference between MET, major difference between MET myoglobin and oxy and deoxymyoglobin is that the iron that's in the myoglobin molecule can be reduced, the two good guys, versus the bad guy, MET myoglobin, is an oxidized. So I think people need to understand if they're going to do try to solve problems with color is that they know need to know the difference between oxygenation and oxidation. So it oxidizes, the iron changes from a plus two to a plus three. I lost one electron. And to get that electron back into the myoglobin molecules, we have to reduce the met myoglobin. The chemistry is there is called met myoglobin reducing activity. And the other thing that you must do is take the oxygen down from about 1% to 3% down to essentially zero. That's less oxygen than the amount of oxygen that's in the atmosphere on top of Mount Everest. That is not easy to do, but muscle can do it easily if you have the right series of reactions and factors affecting it. And so... If they fabricate the meat the first time and then put it in a vacuum package, suck all the air out of it, form a vacuum seal, and as long as it's not a leaker, it will, and if the temperature is right, it will go from purple to bright red to brown and back to purple. That is the key that we everyone needs to know to be able to try to control meat color problems. Now, the other thing that goes along with that is the fact that um, not all muscles do that the same. And we can maybe talk about that a bit later. Absolutely. But Absolutely. Uh, I'm being excited. I'm being excited. And I, I hope I control myself because this, I have like 15 questions for you, but we're not going to go over each of them. <laughs> but I think following up on, on, on the oxygen concentration in the vacuum bag, Sometimes I see some folks, and especially in the industry, for the packaging industry, and, and you taught me this. Whenever you're going to start your vacuum machine, and you can tell the audience about what you do, you check the pressure on the vacuum chamber. Right. Tell me about that, please. Well, you, you, if you put the meat in a bag and put it in the vacuum chamber, the first things it does is it evacuates the air out of the vacuum chamber, and since there's also air trapped in that bag, it kind of comes up and fo- forms a balloon around it. They have a tool. Yeah. You remember the tool that, that we have upstairs? Yeah, yeah. That, that way, if there is in a certain range, you see, okay, you had to be within this range for you to see this vacuum be, chamber. Because, because in order to get the oxygen down to a low enough content is that you've got to have a high partial pressure of of oxygen removal. And that requires good vacuum pumps. And a lot of times in the industry, sometimes they try to package things too fast and run them through too soon before they actually draw enough air out of the bag and it doesn't then fully convert from that brown color met myoglobin back to the reduced deoxymyoglobin color. Would you recommend using the tool? Um, what's the name of the tool you? Well, you it was just a little oxygen oxygen concentration gauge, there and you, you can put that in a bag, send it through your vacuum packager, and see what the partial pressure is. And if it's low enough, why well, then that's when they're going to get the most desired color conversion. If it's lower than that, it's going to be difficult. Um. I think that's a good recommendation. We have um, a lot of our audience and listenership uh, is uh, small and mid-sized processors who run a lot of cycles during the day. Yeah. Yep. And that may be a good recommendation. Uh, get a, a, a vacuum or the, this pressure gauge to, mm-hmm. to kind of know what, what kind of the range your machine is to optimize and because because if if their machine does not have the capability, and sometimes small processors don't have the latest, newest, best equipped vacuum pumps, then they may they may not be able to get as much air out as they really would like. But 
And even that, they may be very successful just by knowing some of the other things that are in there. Because people always in the meat industry, they think you need to have excellent cold chain management. Keep it cold, low microbial growth, and get it in a bag and get it cold and freeze it if you wanted to again. But if you do that, and if the meat is too cold, the color chemistry doesn't run. It's kind of like when you are out shoveling snow off of the sidewalk and your hands get cold, they don't work like they used to. And when, when you got gloves on and it's warm, so you have to have warm chain management to go along with the cold chain management. That is the key that most of them maybe need to focus on is that how long do I need? Because we're talking about surface color. We're not talking about color all the way through. A big chunk of meat, it's just a millimeter, millimeter or two deep. And so they need to just allow that to warm up enough just to get the color chemistry to run. That's the warm chain management. I like that you mentioned surface discoloration, mm -hmm. surface color. How do you relate the color on the surface to microbial growth because I, I, there's a lot of misconception like okay what's the relationship between color and i, I know with dr ram ramathan yeah, yeah. as you we talk about this but uh, what's your uh, take on this well i mean microbial growth is a competitor for oxygen and so if you have too many microorganisms growing then you're going to have discoloration due to microbial spoilage the color that they really need to worry about is the natural color that has nothing to do with microbial growth. And that's why we have so many problems sometimes is that people can't get around spoilage versus the normal color chemistry that occurs on the surface of the meat. In fact, if you look at, they, they take a, a bloom steak that has been exposed to oxygen and then they slice it and look at it they can see a red layer on the top. Just below that, where the oxygen comes down, it gets from 20, 18, 15, down to 1 to 2 percent, and it's, it's brown. There's brown. a brown layer in there, and the rest of the bulk of the meat is purple. So it's, it's, it's just a neat little thing that they could try to see. And, and so if it's so cold that that meat won't change color, and, or as in a retail display case, the brown color after six hours, well, three hours, two hours, whatever, and, and by 12 hours it may be, work the way up, and, and the brown discoloration occurs on the surface of the displayed product. Um, next question, and it's following up on this, and, and I apologize if we'll become a little bit more technical on, on this, but I, we have to talk about the why. Could you please tell us, before we go into the muscle biochemistry between different muscles, can we uh, talk a little bit about mitochondria, NADH, and the relationship between for that and, and meat color, and then we can jump on. <laughs> well, the, the, the mitochondria are, is, is a little subcellular organism in every single cell in our bodies that generates energy metabolism, and they have to have uh, NADH and, uh, and some of those chemical compounds that, uh, for instance, if, if an athlete is playing soccer and they get a cramp in their leg, then their muscles, not it, it tightens up and, oh, they can hardly stand it. And yet somebody comes out and they rub their leg for a while, give it a little time, and they let the oxygen get back in to where they can call, say it doesn't contract anymore, and they can be up and off and going. So it, there's some very practical applications there in terms of is there myoglobin reducing activity? Have you momentarily cut off the, the oxygenated blood supply? But after we harvest animals, why their blood supply is basically gone. Some other people uh, also think that meat color is due to blood. But in most harvest operations around the world, why when they harvest an animal and they remove most of the blood, they'll get 90, 95% out of the blood. So there's, there may be a little bit left in some of those very fine capillaries. And, you know, that really is 
blood is not the issue. It's myoglobin control that is the issue. The biochemistry within the carcass, um, uh, in terms of muscle, uh, yes. or muscle biochemistry is not the same. So we talk about locomotion muscle versus support muscles. And we can talk about more specific between the psoas major and the longissimus. Well, well, we, could, we could use that. That's a good example because the longissimus goes up and down the vertebral column and that muscle, the longissimus muscle, it's the biggest, longest muscle in the carcass. It's also one of the most color-stable muscles because it does some work. And uh, in the locomotion of the animal and the four legs and, and, and same way down in the forequarter and in the hindquarter. And they, so those cells are made and equipped with the right type of chemistry to, to um, metabolize oxygen and, and, and cause motion in an animal. But when we lose that in a carcass, then it loses that ability to maintain a certain amount of NADH. They lose, start to metabolize their glycogen which is converted into glucose, which eventually is converted into lactic acid, and the lactic acid causes the pH of the muscle to go down. And so the normal pH of muscle in a normal critter, if they haven't been excited, if they haven't, if they haven't been stressed before slaughter, their muscle pH will be about 5.6, 5.6, 5.7, if it gets to be 6, then it's a little darker color. If it gets to be 6'4", six, 6'5", six, it's going to be basically unacceptable to most, to most consumers. And it also, since it has a higher pH, it will have greater microbial storage potential, spoilage potential, because of the, uh, the higher pH is more favorable to microbial growth. And that's a different topic that yep. we'll get, to, we'll like to get back to that. And, and I wanted to touch on, on your mentors uh, mm. uh, that have helped you become who you are uh, professionally, uh, as a person. And, and we have to talk about Dr. Kraft that I got, I got the opportunity uh, while I got here in 2016 to still see him in the hallway right. sometimes yeah. and, and say hi to him. Well, Dr. Groff was my undergraduate, and, and uh, I was, when I was an undergraduate student, he was my advisor, he was my judging team coach, and he became a, a, a honored mentor. And it just so happened that he was very interested in meat color. And my master's project and PhD projects also dealt with meat color. And so... Uh, Everything that goes on with, with in my career had to deal with an individual who really liked to teach undergraduate and graduate students and to make them be aware of the industry-related problems with meat color. So he was a real color guru, and I wish I could even be close to what he no, was. No, you, just a, a, lot of, a lot of the future of research in meat color is because of what you and Dr. Kraft have developed and conducted. And, and we see here in, on, on, our, on our side a lot of master's theses and dissertations mm, exactly. that you guys have. Well, and you know, the other thing is that Dr. Kraft and I worked upon is in the early 1990s there was a, an outbreak of E. coli 157H7, a pathogen that, that you do not want to fool with. And that occurred in uh, an outbreak of, uh, of uh, in some hamburger. In, it served in a, a company that was out on the West Coast. And that got us then into, well, why did this happen? Or why does that? And, and we, we discovered that, that despite all these things that we do, if you have meat of a certain color and you cook it, it's what happens on the interior part of the meat that you don't see that is important. And we found a, a situation whereby you could cook meat to a certain low temperature and, and depending upon what the redox form was in the, in the center of the meat, it would be brown, prematurely brown at a temperature too low to kill pathogens. 
and it did on several people. What was the impact of that? The impact was that was that the premature browning. If you're going to cook meat and you're going to have your friends over, you need to use a thermometer to measure the internal temperature to be 160 for one second, and you can be safe to eat and ignore whatever color it is. It could be brown. It could be slightly pink. If I see meat and I'm cooking on a grill and I have the friends coming over for 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 dinner, if it is brown on the inside. I'm worried. If it is pink on the inside, I feel safe. (laughs) So it really, that's just why do we have, that's just just an example of what Dr. Croft helped figure out, is that how could that be? But if it's myoglobin on the inside, you're not going to expect it to turn pink when you cook it because normally it gets browner as you go up in internal temperature. So, Rule of thumb, always measure the temperature of a steak, of a roast, of ground beef, ground pork, ground lamb, whatever. So, uh, Dr. Han, we were discussing about the legacy uh, that uh, Dr. Croft and you are living the industry. A lot of a lot of good concepts, fundamentals, like it's serving, well, will serve as a groundwork for future research in the next 5, 10, 15 years. Um, and as a matter of fact, when I had the opportunity to work in, uh, I had the opportunity to do an internship at Hy-Vee mm-hmm. um, in the meat department. And I've, and in my, uh, some of the conversations that I had in, on the podcast, I've talked about this. And I was able to experience some of the wise meat some of the reasons why why meat is wasted or thrown away at mm-hmm. the retail level, and it, it is a lot of money. I mean, we, in the beginning of the episode, we talk meat color. If you can manage meat color, it's going to save you money in the long run. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a lot of the meat wasted was because if you started having discoloration on the surface, uh, and just a normal consumer when you see some, because it. Let me get back and step back a little bit. If you you go in a, you can see what, 90, 95% in the U.S., it's aerobic. Like I said, all the meat is it's displayed mm-hmm. um, on the, I mean, aerobically with mm-hmm. oxygen, ex, ex, uh, the meat exposed to oxygen. And we talk about this, we will learn from you that it, I mean, oxygen will eventually oxidize the surface mm-hmm. uh, of meat, of fresh meat. And that is temperature dependent. Because if you want to slow down the enzymes that are metabolizing the oxygen and you want a bright red surface metmyoglobin, or oxymyoglobin, then the thing is, is to keep it as cold, as cold as is cold. If you want the color to convert to purple, be an anaerobic package, then you've got to have a warm, stand up, or a warm period in there to get the color chemistry to go from purple to red and go through that color conversion that we discussed earlier. You, so, it, yeah, it's one of the really neat things as part of my career was that, was that I really was enjoyed teaching. I enjoyed research. I enjoyed, uh, and probably for Dr. Croft, for, to do things that was important to the industry. And as long as we have consumers that are going to make decisions about purchasing meat, based on color, then the industry really needs to try to bring themselves up to speed if they aren't already to know some of the factors that affect meat color and color stability. I remember uh, three, four years ago when I, when I asked you about, I mean, I told you about my passion of meat, of meat color mm-hmm. but at the retail level because I saw the amount of meat that was wasted not only in one store, just generally speaking. Mm-hmm. And it, it's, I think it's uh, one of the last uh, uh, papers with Smith in 2000, which put like some of the of the amount of money that is wasted at the retail mm-hmm. level for exactly. that. Exactly. Um, it made me or led me to uh, develop the meta-analysis, which spent some hours going over some of the research that you conducted uh, in the last years. Mm-hmm. And, and we maybe can talk about the discoloration. So 
the swaz major the tenderloin you cut some steaks and on the other side you have some ribeyes or some strip loins you cut them into steaks you have to expect some life lifespan difference in terms of color life that you you, it, you exactly like to call it because that soas major or filet mignon tenderloin muscle it's on one side of the vertebra and just opposite that is the longissimus muscle and it has a color stable versus a color labile and so that's where i think the industry may need to 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 know or to recognize is that those two muscles are made to do different things in a living animal, and they're going to perform differently in a retail case. And so the, the, the tenderloin muscle will probably discolor long before the longissimus does. And so that's time maybe they take that top loin muscle off and they sell the tenderloin by itself. And you don't notice that color disparity as much. So it's a big example, like a T-bone or a porterhouse. Yeah, exactly. You you yep. r- run it through the through the bandsaw, display it, and what? Maybe in the next couple of days or in a day, you see the 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 tenderloin piece of it start to discolor. Yep. While the longissimus or the the strip loin side is still red. So it's you're losing. Is the consumers back to so consumers will will buy. With their eyes, so oh, they're, exactly. they're, they don't like that. They won't buy exactly. it. Exactly. So. Yeah. So and and be, because that becomes in merchandising, as far as uh, the retail stores are concerned, is that how can we minimize those comebacks, or they are they they rearrange the display case looking for one that's got the best color, and color uniformity usually is a is an important criteria. We're gonna uh, almost wrapping up this episode. Um, I, want, I wanted to ask you about your current role at MSA. Uh, what are some of the, the responsibilities and, and your work that you're doing right now? And we think about Professor Emeritus that, okay, you're not going to do anything. You just, <laughs> but, but you're so active. And, and you, I mean, you come to, to Weber Hall, what, like a couple days, three days a week, or yep. maybe every day. Yep. So I, I like, what, what keeps you moving? Well, I like being around people. I like to problem solve. And uh, sometimes uh, it's just, uh, and particularly with meat, meat meetings, uh, there, there's an International Congress of Meat Science and Technology somewhere in the, in the world. We've been to probably 20 of those outside the United States. Which ones? Oh. Which countries have you been in? <laughs> Japan, North or South Korea. Taiwan, um, Ireland, Canada, Ireland, Norway, Belgium, Germany, France. I mean, you can go on and on and on. So many color has and, bring you to many and, countries. And, and, and you know the what is that some some of these people have read a manuscript or a book that we wrote on. Uh, why, you know, the co- stabilizing the color of myoglobin. And uh, that, I don't know, we kind of fell into that. And Rich Mancini was one of my graduate students, and that is the most widely cited manuscript that I have ever been a part of. How many citations so far? And we, I mean, we, we've done that... N- numerous times. Numerous. We'll put it. We'll put it on that. Yeah. But it, it's 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 to be proud. I mean, it just well, it is. It's just it's been kind of at the right place at the right time with the right interest. And there are other important parts of the meat industry. You could talk about tenancy, talk about efficiency of live animal production and interfacing and different uh, nutritional regimens and and that sort of thing. And 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 meat color was just kind of my. My baby. Baby. <laughs> What's for Dr. Han in the following five years? What do you, you want to do? Do you conduct more research? Do you want to do what's your... I, you, I, think, I think if there's any contribution that I could make for young people coming into the industry, and even some of the older ones who are, <laughs> are still there, that is to, uh, if they have color questions, I'm really, I, I, I can go to a poster at a meeting, and I can stay there forever and talk about meat color. Okay. It's, it's a real privilege. Well, thank you for being here.